الصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وعلى اله والصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى قيام الساعه اما بعد indeed all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is one and has no partner and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger after whom there is no more prophet or messenger to come his family his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the hour is established my dear brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh on Monday, we started talking about this concept of Al-Amana Al-Ilmiya or Amanatul Ilm, the trust of knowledge. And I mentioned that the first thing is that a person has to acquire knowledge because you cannot give what you don't have. The one who does not have something cannot give it. So to give, you have to first have. And then the next thing is, in sharing this knowledge, the person has to ensure that the knowledge is correct. Whatever information a person is passing on, that it is sahih. And then the third point is that a person should convey this knowledge in a manner that is clear, so that the receiver or the listener gets the correct message. And so we need to speak to people at their levels. Al-Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, under the book of knowledge in his Sahih, he mentions a statement of Ali radiallahu anhu, who said, خَاطِبُ النَّاسَ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ عُقُولِهِمْ Speak to people at the level of their understanding or intelligence. أَتُرِيدُ أَنْ يُكَذَّبَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ do you want that people should deny Allah and His Messenger? <coughs> because if the message is not put over, put over in a proper way, the receiver may misunderstand it because of the way it is put over. And as a result, they may not believe in what Allah has revealed or what the Prophet ﷺ has come with. So it's also important that the speaker puts over the information in a very clear manner that the people and the listeners can understand. And that is why it is important to use, as we might say, simple language. Simple language that people can relate with. If you were to read the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, if you learn a little bit of Arabic and know a little bit of Arabic, you will find that his, his Arabic is actually quite simple. He hasn't used words or expressions that are hard and difficult to understand. Simple and straightforward, because this is how people understand. By comparison, just to give you an idea, if you were to read Arabic poetry, you will find that it's very hard to understand. Because the goal of poetry is different from, from conveying knowledge. When you're conveying knowledge, the objective or the major objective is to make your reader or listener understand. If you cannot make your listener or reader understand, then you have not done a good job of conveying the message. Poetry, of course, has other objectives. So you find poetry is quite difficult because poets tend to use, uh, you know, rarely used or known words and expressions. And often, they mix up the order of words in a sentence. This is allowed in Arabic language. But if you're not accustomed to this, then sometimes the sentence is hard to understand. So it's important that the message is also conveyed in a manner that is proper, so that the listeners or the receivers do not misunderstand the message. But I want to come back a little bit to the point of ensuring that the message is correct. I have heard people, because I've spoken about this issue in the past, and once a brother said, you know, it seems like the people with, with knowledge don't want anybody else to speak. They only want to speak. And I had to explain to him that that is not the objective. It's not that the scholars don't want anybody else to speak. 
But what they have cautioned us about is to ensure that when we do speak, that what we say is correct. You must have knowledge of your subject. Not hearsay. Islam is not based on hearsay. It is based on sound knowledge of Quran and Sunnah. So often people speak and they say it is reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, this expression in hadith methodology actually denotes something that is weak, unreliable, to say it is reported. If the Prophet ﷺ had said so, say that, say the Prophet has said. But when you say it is reported that the Prophet has said, alayhi salatu as I said in, in uh, Mustalah al-Hadith, this is considered one of the forms of weakness. Sighat al-Tamrid. In fact, even in his Sahih, Al-Imam al-Bukhari has used some of these forms of narration. Sighat al-Jazmi or Sighat al-Tamrid. Forms that denote correctness and forms that denote weakness. So a person needs to know the subject matter, must have researched it, and has knowledge of the subject, then mashallah, you can certainly speak so that the information you're giving to others is correct. Often people grew up hearing certain statements. They're not sure if it's a hadith or it's just a proverb. And sometimes they just classify it as a hadith. Sometimes people quote hadith from different books. They say the hadith is in Sunan al-Tirmidhi or Sunan Abi Dawood. But even if a hadith is in Sunan Abi Dawood or Sunan al-Tirmidhi or one of the other books of hadith, because these authors did not limit themselves only to the Sahih, these ahadith need a little bit further research to ensure that they are authentic. So not because it's mentioned in Tirmidhi, it means it's authentic. I agree, most of the hadith in these books, mashallah, are authentic, are sahih. But some of them are not. So as a speaker, I need to do the research myself. So when I pass on this knowledge and this information, the receivers, the listeners, know that it's authentic, it's valid. Now all of this prompted me, as I said on Monday, that I was uh, talking with a brother on Sunday. And he mentioned that, or he asked me this question about how does a person enter Jannah? Can a person enter Jannah without belief? The reason he asked is he said a few weeks ago at a certain masjid, the Imam given the khutbah, used a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari as proof that even without belief, a person can enter Jannah. Despite the fact that the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear in the Quran that the person who dies with kuf, or with shirk, or with nifaq al itiqad hypocrisy of belief, that these three types of people will be in the hellfire forever. This is what Allah says in the Quran. Despite this, this uh, Imam quoting this hadith as evidence that without belief one can make it to paradise. This hadith, uh, many of you might know the hadith, it's about this lady who was a prostitute, but because of an act of kindness she showed to a dog, giving it water to drink. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah forgave her sins for this. And the Imam quoted this hadith and claim that this hadith is proof that even without belief in Allah, one can enter paradise. The question is, where in the hadith did the Prophet ﷺ say whether or not this lady was a believer or non-believer? It doesn't deal with that issue at all. So that's just an assumption that a person has made. But you see the problem now. All the people who are sitting in the congregation would have heard this. And they would have gone away with perhaps an incorrect understanding. The hadith is sahih. There's nothing wrong with the hadith. But the interpretation or the understanding of the person and then the conveyance of that understanding to others, this is what is problematic. So it is important 
that we not only read hadith and read ayats of the Quran, but that we also look at tafsir and we look at the sharh of the hadith to ensure that our understanding is correct. Because when I read a statement as a human being, I have a certain understanding. But is that what the statement means? This is to verify that I now read what the scholars have said about this statement, whether it's Quran or Hadith. And in this way, I can sort of confirm whether or not my initial understanding is acceptable or not acceptable. This is one of the trust of knowledge that whatever we pass on, first of all, whatever we learn and practice should be authentic. Because we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on certainty, not guesswork. Assuming it may be authentic, we're not really sure. No, we worship Allah on surety. So even when we acquire knowledge for ourselves and practice it, it should be based on what is authentic. And likewise, when we share that with others, it should also be authentic so that no one is misled. Because misleading others is serious. Because now the individual has to answer for all these people that he or she misled. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ advised us, if you have nothing good or correct to say, stay silent. Remain quiet. Don't say anything. Because once you say, you're held accountable. In fact, when the Prophet ﷺ informed the Sahaba that they will be held accountable for the things they say, they were surprised. They said to him, are we going to be held accountable for the things we say? And the Prophet ﷺ said to them, Is there anything that will cause more people to be thrown in the hellfire than the harvest of their tongues? That is the things they say. Sometimes we think words don't hurt. But in Islamic perspective, words are also serious as much as actions. So, in order to carry this trust of bearing this knowledge, knowledge of, that is based on revelation, we have to consider these concepts and these points. That we acquire that which is correct, we practice that which is correct, and we also pass on that which is correct. And when we don't know, we say we don't know or we stay silent. It is said that once a man came to Medina to meet with Al Imam Malik. And he had a list of questions to ask the Imam. And to some of the questions, Imam Malik said, I don't know the answer. And others, of course, he answered the man. And at the end, the man said to Imam Malik, Rahimahullah, he said, You know, Imam, I'm disappointed. Because I heard so many great things about you. But, you know, to many of my questions, you said you didn't know the answer. That doesn't seem like a great scholar to me. And then Imam Malik said to him, when you go back home, you tell the people where you come from that Imam Malik said he doesn't know the answer to these questions. He was not afraid or ashamed or embarrassed to say, I don't know. Because knowledge is amana, it's a trust. And even the Prophet ﷺ, brothers and sisters, when people came to him with certain issues and questions, when he did not have an answer, he stayed silent. He didn't give any answer. He remained silent. He didn't try to show the people that he knew everything. No, he stayed silent till Allah gave him revelation. When the Meccans, for example, came and proposed to him what they thought was a good compromise to unite society, they said to him, we will worship your God for, let's say, one month. And then you will worship our God for one month. And this way, people in society will be united. The Prophet ﷺ did not make up his own answer. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him Quran and he recited that to them. Surah Al-Kafirun. Qul ya ayyuha al-Kafirun, la a'budu ma ta'budun, and so on. When a group of Jews came and asked the Prophet ﷺ to, to describe, Sif lana rabbak, describe your Lord to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him revelation and he recited that. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad. When a man came 
and said to the Prophet السلام, and here he raised what we call a hypothetical issue. He said, O Messenger of Allah, if a person were to go home and find his spouse or her spouse committing adultery, what would happen? What recourse does the person have? And the Prophet السلام, stayed silent because he did not know the answer. He had no guidance yet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eventually, Allah would reveal ayahs from Surah an nur that gave guidance in relation to spouses accusing one another of infidelity or adultery. So only when he received the revelation and the guidance and the answer, did he answer. So even the Prophet والسلام, practiced his own advice. Say good or stay silent. Say what is correct or be quiet, be silent, till you get knowledge. So we should not be afraid or embarrassed to say, Look, I don't know, ask somebody else. Sometimes people answer questions. And then afterwards they go and check up and see whether the answer was correct. Now it's at least good that the person is trying to correct the answer and make sure they, they, their answer is correct. But the problem is, you don't do it after the fact. You do it before. So the best approach would have been to say, look, give me a couple of days, I'll get back to you. But don't answer and then afterwards you're trying now to make sure that your answer is correct. Because what if it's not? Then you have to go back to that person and inform them. And who knows how many other people that person might have spoken to. So this is a trust. An ilm. Ilm is a trust. And we need to bear this trust with, with honor and with truthfulness. And that means we only say what is authentic. Because that is what we have knowledge that Allah demands from us. This is speaking about Allah with knowledge. Remember, Allah has prohibited speaking to, about Him of which we have no knowledge, when we have no knowledge. But when we do, then we can speak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed from mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us what is beneficial to us. May He cause us to benefit from what we learn, and may He uh, increase our knowledge so that we can better serve Him and worship Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to convey the good of the message He has revealed, and may He help us to avoid that which is sinful. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.